Covering him, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Friends, I wanted to take and go a little bit different route here. I told you guys here recently, I really, I'm here to wanting to shake some rabbis up. If you happen to be a rabbi that's listening to this broadcast tonight, I'm, I'm really encouraging you, don't change the channel. Because we're going to get very serious. We're going to have a very serious discussion about some things here that I feel like the rabbis have missed when it comes to the examination of the Torah as well as the, the prophets and the writings, the Navim and the Kotavim. And we're going to start here with the story of Joseph. And I know you've probably already heard the story of Joseph and Christians trying to tell you, you know, that well, that's Jesus and the story of Joseph. You just look at Joseph, he sold for 20 pieces of silver, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver, etc. Well, I'm not here to go that route with you tonight, but I am here to challenge you. Not just the rabbinical community. I'm here to challenge every Jewish listener tonight, including the Muslims as well. I challenge the Muslims that are listening tonight here. You believe that Moses was a prophet of God. You believe that Jesus also was a prophet. Then I encourage you for tonight, listen to what I'm about to share with you. I think it'll bless you. Let's get into it. Starting in the story of Joseph, we're going to kind of bounce around through here, but I want to point to some very important facts here that I think a lot of times totally get overlooked by the rabbinical community. And rabbis, I'm not here to play church with you. I'm not here to, to, to give you the same run of the mill every day. Uh, and no hit on the Baptist with the same Baptist theological seminary ideology that Jesus was the Messiah and this is the reason why you ought to believe it. No, what I'm here to do tonight is I'm here to take you inside of our own writings right here in the Torah, in the Tanakh, right through the prophet Moses here and show you the things that he wrote here and I'm challenging you to take a look at it through a series that I'll be doing here to recognize who indeed was the Mashiach? Who is the Messiah? Let's get started. Joseph in his dreams, chapter 37 of Genesis here. Joseph is having these dreams, upsetting his brothers really bad. That first dream here in verse 7 of chapter 37, he has a dream of his sheaf and their sheaves all coming down and bowing down to his sheaf. And his brethren said to him in verse 8, Shall thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. All right, you know, you guys have already been told, you know, Jesus was spiritual and he was hated for that. That's not where I'm going. All right, we're going to start off by this right here. We're going to go a little bit further down. All right, still. Verse 9, And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it to his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed yet a dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowed down to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren, and his father rebuked him, and said unto him, What is this dream? Thou hast dreamed, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now, my rabbinical brethren, let me just say something to you. Do you know the dream has not been fulfilled? There's no way. Yes, Joseph does go down to Egypt later. He finds out his son, excuse me, uh, not Joseph, but Jacob does go down. He finds out that his son has made uh, the prince of Egypt. But his mother had already passed away. So how do you fulfill a scripture when his mother's passed away? Well, you know, Joseph is a type of the Mashiach. And the only way for it to be fulfilled is through the Messiah. Keep that in mind as we move along here. I want to move down to verse 18. And this is, we, we, as, as, as the dreams are happening, we know that in the story here, what happens here is uh, that Joseph's brothers, they're going, they're feeding the sheep, and his father wanting him to go check on them to see how they're doing. And of course, Joseph was always known to come back and bear the bad report, letting uh, their father know all the evil they had been doing, and they hated him all the more because of that as well. But we're going to look at some very important aspects, though, that happen here, and we're getting down to verse 18 in chapter 37. We'll start with verse 17. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. 
and they saw him far off, and, and before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Now, I want to share you something with you. They conspired to slay him before he even got there. Kind of reminds me of Herod, doesn't it, to you? Before Yeshua. Yeshua had already been born on the earth. Herod, there was report that Herod is Jewish. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But the funny thing is, is before Yeshua could even get started, before Jesus could even get started in his ministry, he conspired to kill him. But I want to show you something even more interesting than that, though. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into one of the pits. And we will say, An evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what shall become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hand and said, Let us not take his life. There's two things I want you to notice here. Now, they said, let us slay him. If you look at the book of Jasher, or Yasha, as it says in the Hebraic language there, the book of Jasher identifies Simon as the brother that conspired to have him killed. And I think that's important to note, regardless of what you feel about the book of Jasher, because it is clearly going to play out in the story of Joseph to begin with when it comes to Simon. Reuben, on the other hand, is another issue as well. If you look at Reuben, he's the one that heard it and delivered him out of their hand and said, let us not take his life. Do you know what Reuben's name means? His name literally means, behold, or look, our son. Or look, a son. Or a son is given to you. You can translate it any way you want, but that's what his name means. If you look in Genesis chapter 29, we read this here, going to verse, um, see if I got it right, verse, verse uh, 32 actually. Didn't have it at the right spot here. We'll stop at verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And served with him yet even seven uh, other years. And we're talking about the story of Jacob here. Jacob goes down to his father-in-law, Laban, falls in love with Rachel, but he gets tricked by his father-in-law and finds out that he gets uh, Leah on the first night of the marriage. And he doesn't know any different until he wakes up the next morning. But anyway, Leah is hated. And the Heavenly Father knew she was hated. So he allows her to bear children but Rachel's womb is kind of held. It says here in verse 31, And the Lord saw that Leah was hated, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord hath looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. You have a type even here in this story Reuben, his very name, Reuben is the very one that cares about Joseph. When they say Reuben, they're saying, look, a son. When Reuben intercedes for Joseph in his very name, look, at, look what happens to Leah. Leah names him Reuben, look, a son. In other words, we've had a son, but she's also afflicted. Now think about it. In the case of Jesus himself, what happens when he's on the cross? Now therefore stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Do you realize that Mary also, like Leah, was hated by the nation of Israel? Maybe not in the beginning, but as soon as this whole issue of Joseph of Jesus began to start, and Joseph was going to put her away privately because she, they find out she's, he finds out she's pregnant, then this whole scandal starts in Israel. That Mary got pregnant by some Roman soldier. We know this why because the scripture says uh, about Jesus said we not that he was a Samaritan and has the devil. A Samaritan is half Jew, half Gentile. 
All right, so they thought that a Roman soldier, no doubt, got Mary pregnant and Joseph was trying to cover it up. So she was looked down upon just like Leah was looked down upon. And of course, who looked down upon her? Jacob. Who is Jacob? Jacob is Israel. Who looks down upon Mary? Israel looks down upon Mary. And then what, is it, what does Jesus say? When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he's on the cross. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son, Reuben. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. All the little things hidden right there in the story of Joseph. There's a lot more, friends. A whole lot more. Let's continue on. Genesis chapter 37, verse 27 to 30. This is when Joseph is being sold. All right. And we find here, I bring this part up here because I think it's important to notice. It says, Come let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brethren hearkened unto him. And they're passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned into the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit and he rent his clothes. All right? Now, here's what gets interesting. Some people like to try to say, well, when you look at the story here in the Bible, <laughs> Joseph's brothers never were the ones that sold him in the first place. They were going to sell him to the Ishmaelites, but the Midianites come by, they get him out of the pit, and they're the ones that sell him off. That's not true. Again, if we turn to the book of Jasher, we find out what actually happens. And all you have to do, if you want to look this up for yourself, go to uh, chapter 42 of the book of Jasher, read uh, verses 6 through 19. It'll tell you in more detail actually what happens. Yes, they did intend to sell him to the Ishmaelites from the beginning, but while they were discussing it, and remember, they had pulled afar off from the pit where Joseph was at because they didn't want to hear his cries, no doubt they did the same thing to Jesus. But the point is, is while they were doing this, they were conspiring to sell him to the Ishmaelites when they saw them coming. But the band of Midianites go by them. They go to the pit, pull Joseph out. And Jasher records as they're trying to flee with Joseph without even paying for him, that Simeon challenges them and threatening them with their lies if they didn't give him back. And then the argument ensues. And they said, well, I thought you said he was your servant. But they said he doesn't look like a servant. But the book of Jasher says that the children of Israel sold Joseph to the Midianites. And then the Midianites later, fearing that they had gotten a son of a prince, were afraid and sold him to the Ishmaelites. And that's how the story actually goes. Sometimes it's kind of good to have books like that just to kind of clarify some issues that might not seem as clear as you think there. All right, so anyway, uh, goes on to say, And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and as for me, whether, whether shall I go, says Reuben, when he finds out the death of his brother there. Now I find it interesting as well, because we get into verses 31 to 36, this is where they take Joseph's coat. They're trying to cover up their sin of actually conspiring against their brother. And he's already been sold off now, going down to Egypt to become a slave. And so they take, and they took Joseph's coat and killed a he-goat and dipped the coat in blood. Now if you're reading in King James, it's going to be worded a little bit different here. But still, this, the jest of the story stays the same. And they sent the coat of, they say many colors. Uh, I believe that's it, what it is in the Septuagint is where we get this word, many colors. Uh, technically speaking, in the Masoretic text, it's a coat of long sleeves. But uh, I believe that we probably have a little bit more insight from the Septuagint because the Septuagint, of course, is taken from a different translation that we don't have today. And they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it is thy son's coat or not. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. And evil beasts have devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn in pieces. You know, I'll tell you something, friends. I believe that 
from this particular part of the story here is where we get in the Levitical law the story of the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat. As we read over here in Leviticus chapter 16, and let me just start with verse uh, 5 here, then we'll move down with it. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two he goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall present the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot of, for the Lord, and the other lot for Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat upon which the lot fell for the Lord, and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall set alive before the Lord to make an atonement over him, to send him away from Azazel into the wilderness." Now, if you begin to really look at the story of both Joseph and that of Jesus, both these characters are played out in the very sacrificial law written in Leviticus here in chapter uh, 16. Because in the case of Joseph, Joseph became that scapegoat and he was set loose. He was taken by the strong man, by the Ishmaelites, down into Egypt. Whereas the sacrificial goat became that innocent little lamb that, that his brothers killed to try to cover their sins. And I'll tell you something, friends, and I've said this many times over the years and everything. You know, it may look like a bad thing what they did, and I agree it was. But you know what? According to Levitical law, had they not done what they did, then God would require the blood of Joseph at their hands. But the blood of an innocent lamb, that's what atoned for them. It was the innocent lamb. It was Christ Jesus, the innocent lamb, that his blood was spilled and also by Israel, his blood was spilled in modern days or 2,000 years ago, modern days for the Jews there in that time. His blood was spilled out and no doubt Israel saying, discern, Father, whether this be your son or no. Remember what they said at the cross? Let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and deliver him. It's the same words almost as what they're saying here. Is this your son or not? Jesus is dying on the cross. He begins to speak in an unknown tongue. And they go to give him some water or vinegar mixed with gall. And they said, let him alone. Let him alone. Let's see if, if, if Elias will come and deliver him. Let's see if God, if it's his son or not. What did they say? If thou be the son of God, come down off of this cross. Joseph's brothers went up there and said, Is this your, said to their daddy, Is this your son's coat? Yes or no? It's too late then, wasn't it? Then sold out to the devil. Hmm. Let's move on to Genesis chapter 39. Actually, before we go there, <laughs> yes. I think I've had this out of sequence just a little bit here, but we'll see here in just a minute. Yes. We look at Genesis chapter 39. And I actually, I'm missing one. So what we'll do is we'll jump back over here and we'll change this one here to Genesis chapter 39. For the sake, I didn't realize I was actually missing one of my chapters that I had lined up. In Genesis chapter 39, I want to look here at verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, or Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him out of the hand of the Ishmaelites that had brought him down thither. Now, I find it interesting that Potiphar, being a guard of Pharaoh, is the one that actually buys Joseph to begin with. You know, Israel sold Jesus off as well. 
First, they sold him off to the priests. The priests handed him over to what? The Roman soldiers. And don't forget, though, that even the priests came down with their guards to pick him up. But they handed him over to the Roman authorities, and Joseph was a prisoner just as Christ was a prisoner in the flesh. From the time that Joseph was sold out by his brethren, Joseph became a prisoner until he was elevated to the prince of Egypt. All right, now, if we move down to verse 11, this is when we get into the story as we know he's blessed, everything he touches is blessed, Pontifer's house is blessed by having Joseph work there, and Potiphar has basically committed everything into Joseph's hands because of the blessings that, that, he, that God blesses him with. And he knows that. He realizes that he's blessed on the account of Joseph. But then comes trouble. Potiphar's wife, which, by the way, is a perfect type of Rome. Israel takes under the Maccabees Everybody thinks the Maccabee revolt was a great thing. Well, the revolt was in order to get the temple restored back to the rightful place. But unfortunately, the Maccabee brothers immediately began to overtake the priesthood, the kingship, and completely the true priesthood, the Levitical line, is thrown out the window and established with a false priesthood to start with. So those of you that like to say the Jews living in the land today are not real Jews, I don't agree with that, but I will say this is probably a false priesthood because it's a priesthood of the Pharisees, which is a time from the Maccabees of their false priesthood they set up. The true priesthood was down in Qumran. That's something you're not going to, many people are going to be willing to tell you, but I'll tell you the truth anyway. All right, but anyway, as we know though, Potiphar's wife is trying her best to seduce Joseph. And Pilate was trying his best to get Jesus to confess, to go along, be part of the program. He never would. She caught him by his garment saying, Lie with me, and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when, he, when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called upon the men of her house and spoke unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. Let me tell you something. The only one that was adulterous in the entire time during the days of Jesus when he was on earth here, and that was Israel that was whoring around with Jezebel and the Roman authorities. Of course, Jezebel was a time before that, but that's how it all got started. And then the Maccabees later bring in Rome to be an ally to Israel. By the way, my Jewish brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. This is why you see Rome having such a major influence in Israel today. Because Shimon Perez sold you out like Ahab sold out Israel and brought Jezebel idolatry into Israel. Shimon Perez brought idolatry back into Israel because why? The scriptures got to repeat again. The Jewish people at the time 2,000 years ago did not believe that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. So when he was crucified, that work was cut short. Isaiah 9. And he'll be cut off not for himself, you were looking for the Messiah to deliver you from the Roman bondage. Well, you put yourself right back under Roman bondage. So you still got to be delivered from the Romans. Think about it. All right? Now, at any rate, though, the same thing happened with Jesus. They ended up with his garments. Matthew chapter 27, they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture they did cast lots. Well, Potiphar's wife got Jesus or Joseph's garments. Right? Now, it's going to get interesting, don't worry. We're moving along. So as we move forward, Genesis chapter 4, we're going to go to, to verse 8 here. From 8 to 15, Joseph is in the dungeon. Uh, 
This one's interesting in my opinion too. Another beautiful type as well. I want to start here in verse 8 here because this is where Joseph begins to interpret the dreams of both the butler and the baker. And the butler and the baker is very important because the butler is a type of Rome. Watch what we read here. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream. There is none that can interpret it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell it me, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In, uh, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine, there, uh, vine were three branches, and it was budding, and it blossomed, shot forth. The clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes, and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes, and pressed them in Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within yet three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head and restore thee unto thine office. And thou shalt give Pharaoh's cup into his hand and after the former manner when thou wast uh, his butler. But have me in thy remembrance when it shall be well with you. And show kindness, I pray thee, unto me and, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house or out of this dungeon. As it says in the King James. Alright? But here's the thing though. He doesn't do it. And the baker, he sees his dream, tells him the interpretation. You're going to be hung in three days and hung on a tree. And he is. He's killed. All right? Now, if you drop down, though, to verse 23, in the same chapter, chapter 40, this is at the very last of it. We'll start with verse uh, 22. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph but forgot him. You know how long he forgot him? Well, you're going to find out. Chapter 41, and I believe it's at the very beginning. Pharaoh is beginning to have those dreams. He has the dreams about the, the, the kine or the cows there. How there were seven well-favored fat calves. And then suddenly seven ill-favored ones rise up, very scrawny, no meat on their bones or anything, and they devour. It had to be a horrible dream to see these little scrawny cows all skin and bones. Maybe their teeth looking more like fangs than the regular teeth. I don't know. But, you know, the point is, is they eat up the other cows. And then he has another dream. Right in behind it. And there's sheaves that rise up. Seven of them. Well, good ears, everything. Then an east wind comes along, which would be the opposite direction of the westerly wind that brings rain into the region there. An east wind comes, which would do the opposite for the land. It would turn it into a dust bowl. And those sell seven ill-favored ears of, of grain come up and devour all the other ones. And of course, the Pharaoh is freaking out. What does this mean? It's obvious he's having a spiritual dream, but what does it mean? And nobody can give him the interpretation. And then suddenly, here we go, the butler says to Pharaoh, I make mention of my fault this day. Two years, friends, two years. Joseph was left in the dungeon. Two thousand years. A thousand years is a day with the Lord, right? 2,000 years, Jesus Christ has been left in the dungeon, the catacombs of the Vatican, while the popes, the, the priests, are all out there about their communion services and giving their little wafer to everybody, having their little catechism class, and the things that Christ taught have been left in the dungeon. He's been forgotten. Oh, you haven't forgotten to go serve your your wine cup there to Pharaoh. Oh, and they claim it's going to God. But isn't it interesting how they, they have the sun disk? Everything Egyptian that you can think of that's in the Vatican is Egyptian. And so Christ is forgotten. And instead, these 
communion services that they continue to do. And I'm not against communion either, friends. I'll tell you something. I believe in doing communion. Jesus said to his disciples, do this as oft as in remembrance to me. I think you should be doing communion practically every day of your life. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. Not like <laughs> the butler here who totally forgets completely about Joseph. And then I find out today, a friend sends my wife, she just told me before coming on air here, didn't even get a chance to, to see who it was that sent it, but a friend sent us this website. And it's talking about how that the Dead Sea Scrolls, the public gets one form of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the other part of the Dead Sea Scrolls that the, they don't want the public to see, a lot of that was hidden where? Right in the Vatican catacombs. Take it out of Qumran, go hide it in Rome. What do you know? Also in Leningrad as well. Hmm, that's interesting, isn't it? The Eastern Church got some, Western Church got a little bit, they even claim the Jews got a little bit. But we know from one, um, one lady that worked on that, and a Jewish uh, a scholar, said that there were two books of Isaiah, one with meaningful differences, not exactly according to the one that they put publicly for us that matches the Masoretic text. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? No wonder why God says he has to send two witnesses in the last day. No wonder why he says to his, to his apostles when they ask him, doesn't the scripture say that Elias must first come and uh, come? And Jesus answers them and said, yes, he must first come and restore all things. Or actually he says, he shall first come and restore all things. That's the correct uh, words that he used. Why? Because Rome, rather than feeding the sheep, they just left Jesus in the dungeon. Uh, this, this troubles me. Let me share something to you with my Jewish friends that are listening here. I'll show you. You want to know the who's drinking the cup? Here it is. I, Obadiah chapter 1, verse 14. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that escaped, neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. Now, Obadiah is talking about Esau. And they're also talking here about the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto you. Thy dealing shall return upon thine own head. All right? Whoops, sorry, wrong one. For as you have drunk upon my mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down and shall be as though they have not been. There's your cupbearer in the days of Joseph, but only in modern days, Rome. We know this because it was Rome, Titus, the Roman general, that ransacked Jerusalem. And Obadiah is now accusing and telling you who it was. Right? That's men only drinking in that particular verse right there. And the Pope of Rome did what? Well, guess what he did. The Pope of Rome came right there to Jerusalem. Ooh, they don't want me to let you see this, do they? Let's see if we can get it back up here again for you. Yes. The Pope comes right there. They're in the upper room. And he's coming there to do what? He's coming there to fulfill that scripture over in Obadiah. Where they says, Ki ka'asha shutetem. And they will drink, but it's masculine, plural, men only. And he comes there in the upper room, right above King David's tomb, and holds that mass. But they don't want you to know that, do they? What is it? It's a type. There's your communion table right there. See? While Christ is buried in the dungeon, Joseph is left to rot because Pharaoh's butler can't remember anything for two years. Such a great miracle happened for this man that his dream is uh, interpreted and it happens, it happens exactly to the dot and he can't remember. And there's your communion right there. Now, let me tell you something though, friends. 
I'm not here to, to give all Catholics a hard time, not even the popes or the priests either. Because God says in his word in Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. So God's got some of his people that are in the Catholic system. So I'm not here to condemn them. I realize that God's got his people in there. He's got people in there, good Christians that love the Lord, maybe even Jews. Maybe that a, a passage applies compound to both Christians and Jews that have made the covenant with Rome in this day. All right? But we are looking at the story of Joseph and the types of Christ. All right? So let's move on down. We're going into Genesis 41. We want to drop down to verse 30 to 31. This is the famine has already begun. Okay? So the famine has started and everything. And we know according to the story and everything, Joseph does get remembered finally by the butler. He brings him up out of the dungeon. Makes me wonder if the Vatican is not going to do something that's going to shock the world. But, uh, but nonetheless, Joseph is brought out. One thing is I'm afraid the Vatican might try to bring you an anti-type, <laughs> in my opinion. He's brought out of the dungeon. He reveals the dreams of Pharaoh, what they are. Pharaoh is so impressed with the interpretation that he makes Joseph effectively a prince of Egypt. He is... No man higher except the Pharaoh himself. And oddly enough, Joseph is now put into a position and the famine has begun. He says, And there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten. He's talking about the, what's going to happen. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine which followeth, for it shall be very grievous, as Joseph is interpreting the dreams here. Right? But what I find interesting too is that that famine is also typed of what would happen in the latter days. Over in the book of Amos, we turn to Amos chapter 8, and we look at verse 10 and 11, and I will turn your feast into mourning and your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the mourning for an holy for an only son. And the end thereof as a bitter day. And behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. That famine is to repeat in this day, just like it was in the times of Egypt. And notice as well, and I will make it as the mourning for an only son, as it was even in the case of Joseph when the famine was in. There was a mourning for Joseph. And there's going to be another mourning for the second Joseph. Jesus, the Messiah that was missed. All right, let's move on. In Genesis chapter 42, Joseph's brothers come down to Egypt. And by the way, I find it interesting as we read here in Genesis 42, we'll start with verse 3. And Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy corn from Egypt, but Benjamin, Joseph's brother Jacob, sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure harm befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down to him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. But made himself strange to them, and spoke roughly with them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies, to see the nakedness of the land. You are come. 
Now, a couple things I want to share with you here. One, his dream was being fulfilled, the first one. Second one, not, but the first one, yes. Now they bowed down before him, but all 11 of them will bow down, which will include Benjamin, which is later fulfilled. This part's not fulfilled as of yet, but it gets fulfilled later. Now, Joseph says that they were spies, the spying out the land. If you look at the book of Jasher, that actually would make a little bit more sense because according to the book of Jasher, when they go down to Egypt, they actually want to try to find Joseph because they want to make right what they did wrong. And they divided themselves up and they went each one to a different gate and went that way there. And before they went to buy corn, according to the book of Jasher, they searched for Joseph. Oddly enough, according to the book of Jasher, they went to the house of the prostitute to look for him. I find it fascinating with Israel today because Israel today is still looking for the Messiah. They sold him out 2,000 years ago, but they are looking for him. And instead of looking for him the correct way, they have also done as Joseph's brothers did, according to the book of Jasher, they went to the whorehouse to look for him. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, the modern day Roman church. And so Shimon Perez and Prime Minister Netanyahu and many of the Rabbis, Rabbi Lau and other rabbis of Israel went to the whorehouse. What are you looking for? You know, Joseph even asked them in the book of Jasher, why did you look for me there? Did you really think that he would be there? My Jewish brothers, sisters, rabbis, do you really think that Rome is where he would be? Let's read on. Modern Israel and their failure to bring their brothers back. Um... Let's move down. Actually, I'm sorry. I was reading something different here, friends, just for a second here. In verse 17, let's move down to verse 17 of the same chapter 42 here. Joseph, of course, is accusing them of spies. And so he says here in verse 15, Hereby you shall be proved, as Pharaoh liveth, you shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and you shall be found bound, that your words may be proved. Whether there be truth in you, or else, as Pharaoh liveth, surely you, you are spies. And he put them all together into the ward for three days. Locked them up. And Joseph said unto them, the third day, thus do and live, for I fear God. If you be upright men, let one of your brethren be bound in your prison house, but go ye and carry corn for the famine of your houses. Now, oddly enough, he's going to bind Simon. There's two interesting things about binding Simon. One, Simon was the one calling for his death, according to the book of Jasher. Secondly, the word Simon's name actually means hears. It's hearing. So when Simon was bound, the hearing of Israel is bound in type and in the shadow of this. But I find it even more provocative that the three days that they were locked up is also a type laying in prophecy. And if you look at that in Hosea's prophecy, we read this, Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his presence. Israel in type, 3,000 years from the prophecy of Hosea in 780 B.C. when he prophesied, how that Israel would go into captivity, the house of Israel first in 780 B.C., and then later in 70 uh, A.D., the house of Judah goes into captivity, 
And for 3,000 years nearly, the two houses are in bondage. Just like Joseph did when he locked them all up in the ward for three days. But while it was yet the third day, in the th he opened it up and brought them out. In the third day, he will raise us up. I think it's beautiful. It's, it's, um, you know, and that's a prophecy of Christ. Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ. Clearly, there's no doubt about it. In Genesis chapter 42, we move on, starting in verse 19. He says, If you be upright men, let one of your brethren be bound in your prison house. But go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brethren to me, so shall your words be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul, when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. All right? Now, I find it interesting that when we look at this and you see how that they're, they're distraught over the fact of leaving Joseph down there. And then if we begin to look at the scriptures, look at the parable that Jesus gave over in Matthew. And that's Matthew chapter 18. What does he say? Verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How think you if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? Do you not realize that Jesus is actually giving you a type of what happened to Joseph? You see, when Joseph's brothers allowed him to be taken and sold out, they didn't go looking for their brother. They should have, but they didn't. And now in Genesis 42, we find out that they're really beginning to regret not going back for him. Because Abraham, our forefather, is a type of what we should be to one another. When Lot, his own nephew, had been taken by that wicked king from Iran. What did Abraham do? Against a group of giants, he takes his men, well outnumbered, four kings with all their soldiers and everything, and he goes down there and he delivers Lot from their hand. He didn't waste any time. That's what the seed of Israel is supposed to be like. All right? Now, Genesis 42, 24. I got Ezekiel here too, but I forget exactly why I put Ezekiel here. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. Oh yes, here we go. This is also part of that as well. Let me just show you something here where Israel went wrong. The Lord of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Even to the shepherds, thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the shepherds of Israel that have fed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You did eat the fat, and you clothed you with the wool. You killed the fatlings, but you fed not the sheep. Jeez. The weak have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought back that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force have you ruled over them, and with rigor. My rabbinical brethren, do you realize that the prophet here in Ezekiel is also prophesying to Israel? You didn't go after your brother, the house of Israel, after she was taken into captivity. Oh, you fed yourselves, as he says here. 
Prophesy against the shepherd of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Even the shepherds, thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the shepherds of Israel that have fed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the sheep? You did eat the fat, you clothed you with the wool. You killed the fatlings, but you fed not the sheep. You know what? Mm. That was a shame upon us. Again, another type that what we're supposed to do is go look for our brother. Instead of just sitting around in Israel wondering about what war we should be waging with the neighbors and taking out Iran or taking down Syria, we should be looking for the Messiah. You should be looking for the lost sheep of the house of Israel that are scattered abroad the earth. But no, you're too busy feeding yourself. And you've forgotten the sheep. You're eating the sheep instead of that. Instead, neither have you brought back that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force have you ruled over them and with rigor. So were they scattered because there was no, she no shepherd, and they became food to all the beasts of the field and were scattered. Unreal. Moving to Genesis 42 and 24. This is where Simon is actually bound by Joseph. And as I said before, it to me is a type of the hearing of Israel. You have ears to hear and cannot hear. Eyes to see and cannot see, the prophet said. Then Joseph commanded to fill their vessels with corn and to restore every man the money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus it was done unto them. Now an interesting thing happens as this, as this happens here. As you move on down in this particular verses here, they loaded up their, 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 their donkeys with the provisions. They're headed back. And then as they stop at an inn at a hotel... Verse 27, as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the lodging place, he espied his money. And behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they turned trembling one to another, saying, What is this that God hath done unto us? Do you know why he found his money in his sack? Because it was a type and a shadow that we would reject the Messiah when he would come. And the first time he was rejected was in the hotel. When Joseph was trying to find a place for Mary to birth Jesus, he goes to a hotel to try to give her a decent birthing place, but there was no room found for him in the inn, as the Bible says. And I believe this is in the book of Luke. No, I'm sorry. Well, it's in the book of Luke as well. But there was no place for him found and Mary her son Jesus a type of Joseph was rejected in his mother's womb at the inn at the hotel the lodging place that's why this shows it there we go on to read as well of course their money is returned why because you cannot you, you sold him that's just to let you know what you've done. Of course, they, they got it. They got the picture of what he was saying. Now in Genesis 43, the time is coming that they're getting ready to return home. All right. The famine was sore in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, that their father said unto them, Go again and buy us a little food. And Judah spoke unto him, saying, The man did earnestly forewarn us, saying, You should not see my face, except your brother be with you. And they got to bring Benjamin down. And you know, friends, I'll save a little bit of time here with you. They go down. 
When they get there, they take double the money. Jacob allows them to go. Doesn't do it willingly, but he allows them to go. When they get down there, they're nervous. They go to the Joseph's head of his own home that he has there, his, his butler, so to speak. And they're trying to talk to him, let him know that, you know, it was a mistake. We brought our money back. We don't know who did it. But he reassures them, God has blessed you with your money back. And there's an interesting thing that happens in about verse 24 that I also noticed in this story here. And that is that the man that brought them in into Joseph's house gave them water and they washed their feet. And he gave their asses Provender, give them some food. And they made ready the present against Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that he should eat bread there. You know, it's a type of a communion service, isn't it? Isn't it interesting also that that steward of the house prepares water for them to wash their feet? Remember when Jesus says if you, to Simon Peter, unless you let me wash your feet, you have no part with me? Jesus knew the scripture had to be fulfilled. And what's interesting as well, though, there was one man, Simon, in Luke chapter 7, verse 44. I'm actually in the wrong one for that. I didn't put it up here. I apologize. But anyway, in Luke 7, 44, we know that Simon... He doesn't give water to wash the feet of Jesus when he comes. He's unwelcomed. Jesus rebukes him for that. But that woman, a prostitute, comes and washes him with the tears from her eyes and dries his feet with the hair of her head. Right? But at any rate, Joseph has got one last test for him. He sees his brother Benjamin. He can hardly contain himself. But when they're getting ready to go back, Joseph orders his steward to put his cup in Benjamin's bag and restore all their money back in full. When they're leaving, he has his guard overtake them. And he says, whoever, or, you know, he asks the question, why did you steal my master's cup? And of course, they're willing to say whoever, you know, they didn't, nobody would have taken it, but they said whoever it's with, you know, he can be, will be there, be, your, be his bondman. But they weren't expecting the cup was in Benjamin's bag. Let me tell you, though, my Jewish brothers and sisters, why the cup was in Benjamin's bag. He was the innocent brother, wasn't he? Yes, he was. But the cup was found in his bag because Christ would be rejected at the communion table by his own people. And the Benjamites, though Benjamin was innocent then, the Benjamites, 1,500 years or 1,800 years later, would not recognize Christ. They would not recognize the second Joseph. And they would call for his blood, let his blood be upon us and our children. That's why that cup was there. And unfortunately, that's the way it went. But it was a sign to us. As a Jewish people, all these were signs. Failing to have a place in the end for Christ. All these were signs, beautiful signs, to identify the Messiah. I hope you'll consider this today. If you would like to be a part and support the work we're doing here to try to help our brothers, our Jewish brothers and sisters to see that Jesus indeed is the Messiah, support the work we're doing. We do need your help, and I don't mean it lightly, I mean it very seriously. Because we have dedicated our lives full time to his service, reaching the people around the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing the prophetic insights on our news broadcast, Israeli News Live. Right now, though, we're under a major campaign to try to help more of our Jewish brothers and sisters to recognize our rabbi friends, to recognize 
where they miss the Mashiach and these insights hidden in the Torah. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Visit our website, israelinewslive.org. You can also donate there. You can, if you prefer to mail, you can see that at the bottom of the screen here, right here on the left, Danoon Institute, 8297 Champions Gate Boulevard, number 442, Champions Gate, Florida, 33896. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for supporting this broadcast. If you have a blog or a website, write about the work we're doing here. Share it with your friends. Include a backlink to Israeli News Live. That'll help us get the message out as well. And do pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem in such a time when there is Ain Shalom. There is no peace. Good evening.